Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I hope you, some of you had a chance to get on vacation and just visit around a little bit. And uh, I really do like to go away, but I like to come home too. So, but I'm glad you came today. We have a good service planned uh, for today. Uh, I wanted to just uh, just welcome those at home and tuned in. And then I wanted to say just uh, if you remember. Uh, Emmy, in your prayers, uh, this is about a year now from when her husband Andy died. So honestly, uh, some sometimes those are difficult times uh, uh, that uh, you remember and that type of thing. So you just pray for her. And then I wanted to tell you this. Uh, I contacted the uh, Harrisburg Cougars, the Harrisburg football team, and I asked them if they needed uh, a chaplain. And they needed a chaplain, and I asked them, I said, uh, I said to Coach Calvin Everett, I said, Calvin, I, uh, I love the Lord, I've been in ministry 30 years, and I love Cougars. I love the Cougars. So I'm offering my services, and uh, he th I, I, I know he didn't get back with me for about, uh, for about four days. I texted him. He didn't get back with me for about four days, and I thought, just in my insecurities, I thought, oh, he's trying to figure out a way to stay because Titus plays for the Cougars, Tim coaches for the Cougars, Kevin plays for the Cougars. I thought he was looking for a way to say, no, we have enough Browns. <laughs> we have enough Browns on our team. And I just thought he was looking to figure out a way to say that without offending the Brown family. So uh, and then he finally got back with me and said, "Oh no, we'd love to have your have you do our services, pray before the games, and that type of thing." So I said, "Well, I'll meet with you, and we'll see what you expect out of me, and that type of thing." So, anyways, uh, I don't really want to stand on the sidelines. I have this big, nice, fat cushion that on the bleachers, and it is so comfy. So, uh, but uh, so I'll pray with them, and then climb up the bleachers and watch the game. So. Anyways, but uh, you pray for them. I'm hoping to get involved with uh, even uh, the players, and you have a you have access to everybody if you're a, you know a chaplain that type of thing. So you pray that I'll be able to speak the word into their lives. So, anyways, uh, I thought it's a good thing. Uh, so, but anyways, why don't we open in a word of prayer and ask God to speak to us today and uh, encourage our hearts with what we're about. To say so, let's pray. Let's, Father, I ask you, Lord, as we turn our hearts and open our service today, <coughs> what we've planned, Lord, is built around you, built all around you, Lord, to speak to our hearts, not only to speak to our hearts, Lord, for you to receive our worship as we just, even just as we uh, sing to you, the audience of one. I ask you to just receive our worship today. I ask you to encourage us for all the different varied things that have happened to people, good and bad, this week. I ask you to encourage our hearts today from your word, Lord, like only you can. Speak to our hearts and help us to respond then. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to go ahead and sing some songs to Jesus this morning. Our first one is in Christ alone. Solid. 
Lighthouse family. Good morning, online audience. It's good to be here today. I missed you guys last week, but I was online watching. So I just want, that song is beautiful. When you think about God's love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. God's love never runs out on me. And then there was a line in there that kind of got me. My debt is paid. If we would just resonate on that and ponder that for just a minute about how our debt has been paid. I remember when I received the gift that Christ died on the cross for me and my debt was paid. It was like freedom from my past sin. And I had a good time with my cousins last week and I had opportunity to share my faith a little bit with them. It was so good to see them. I know they might be watching today. Hey, if you are. So it was good. And, and we were talking. We were laughing and carrying on a little bit and remembering some things. And then I, and then I had shared some things the pastor told the church about me. I said he told the congregation about um, me as a teenager. So, and I said, <laughs> <laughs> we were, they were dying. They are like, no way. Yeah. So, and I said, yeah, a way. And I said, exactly. but you know, guys, much forgiven much thankful i have been forgiven much and i am thankful for much and they were like so i think i was speaking greek to them at yeah. one point but i encourage them to tune in online and check us out and you know maybe through that they'll they'll receive christ i hope so i hope they're tuning in today but love that so a couple i have a little friend helping me today so <laughs> my name's jordan schrader so it's good to have her today i need a pretty face up here so anyway so um, we, have, we have Worship in the Park coming up, and we keep talking about this. Teresa has put together a wonderful sign-up sheet for, for food out there. Please sign up. A lot already have, and we appreciate that. Please sign up to bring something to that. And we're going to have the bounce house again. We've got boards. I'm already, I have my trusty clipboard with me, so if you don't want to help me, don't make eye contact with me <laughs> this week. But uh, with boards, volleyball, egg, we're going to be throwing eggs. And so that's always a fun time, and I'm recruiting help for that. But it, it is good. But most of all, you know, invite someone, encourage someone to come with you. And um, it is a good time. Angela was telling me that her little guys say, oh, I can't wait for the carnival. It is a carnival. <laughs> Truly is a carnival. Camp. But when you think about this, you know, we have these big meetings. We join all these people together. And how can, what can we change? But it's working. So we're going to do it another year. It's working another year. So everybody seems to enjoy it. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Appreciate your support. So it is working. And as long as we, you know, it's working, we're going to keep doing it. So then I wanted to remind you, we have invite cards. Oh, I love, well, back, back that up one. This is made, back up one, Pam, can you? Oh, maybe not. Okay, the watermelon. I was dying for watermelon after I put that picture up there. So there might be a showing of watermelon, I'm just saying, because I signed up for fruit. I'm gonna do what I want, so I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyway, I love that. So anyway, um, I, got, I heard Jordan's mom talking to me about how Jordan goes into different restaurants and when after they eat lunch and stuff, and she'll hand out invite cards to the waitresses. So I love that. I love that. I think we have a future evangelist here, the gift of evangelism. So I've asked Jordan to talk to us a little bit. So I'm going to pull this off. Sorry. Okay. So tell us what you tell the waitresses or waiters. I tell them if you don't. If you can't come to church this weekend or any time, you can watch it online. Just saying. I love it. So she hails them with my card, invites them to church, and said, but if you can't, so that's not like being brass or, ooh, you know, like she's very kind to them. And then one time at Pizza Hut, what happened? The waitress that um, I gave it to, she set it on the table next to the cash register, and she said, and she said it there, and she said thank you, so other people that work there could see it. So other people that work there can see. So it's being passed on, and I love that. Thank you, Jordan. I'm so glad to hear that story, and I think it's important that we hear that stuff and be reminded. I know even when we travel, I'll leave these, because on there you can find your way to the website or our Facebook page and people all over the world actually do tune into our services once in a while, so I love that. And I thought about this, I was reading something today about sharing our faith, but I believe Jordan is a young example of living the mission of the church. That is what our mission is, to invite others to, to come and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if someone comes or tunes in online, 
Stars in heaven. Crowns? <laughs> stars in your crown. So right. Hey, let me that. just say this about tuning in online. We arrived, the last time we were in Africa, we arrived in Africa, and we were preaching in a certain church, and their church, they, we drove back in these crazy roads up and down, and I arrived, and I saw their church sign, and it had, they had on the sign, helping people find their way back to God. And I said, where did you get that? And they said, online, from your church. <laughs> It's on right. our church sign. Yeah, it's yeah. on our church sign. So they said, we saw your church sign online, and we liked it. So we got it in Africa. So, so strange. I love how Lighthouse is very far-reaching. I love that. We, you know, it's not just in this building. We are very far-reaching. And we want to keep doing that and keep reminding you. And I, kids, I'm never going to stop. So just saying. So grab a business card there, a Lighthouse card. I keep calling them business cards. Lighthouse card, they're in your pews, they're all over the building here and there. If you need more, let me know and we'll make sure you get as many as you need. Jordan told me she sneaks some sometimes. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you, tell your mom you can take as many as you want. So you got no, no, limit on the, no limit on the business card. So, I love that. And then I wanted to do this. We have some juniors going to camp this week. They are leaving Monday morning. Come on up, kiddos. Let's get it. We want to have a word of prayer over you and just uh, ask God to protect you. Mr. Tony, come on up. Come on up if you're going to junior camp. No, Mr. Tony's praying. Come on up. He'd like to go. All right. We have a few more that aren't here today. I know the Vaughn grandkids are going. And, um, is Jordan going? And no. oh, she's not able to. Uh, no, um, Olivia. She's going to be now. Okay. Yeah, she's going. Oh, she's not old enough yet. So, Tony, can you pray over our kiddos? Sure. Let's bow our heads so we can pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this opportunity to be able to, to be up here and be able to pray for these kids, Lord, that you have blessed to be here. And I just pray, Lord, for safe travels and that mm -hmm. you open up their hearts and their minds to be able to learn and be able to absorb the knowledge and absorb everything that you have done for them that we may always take advantage of lord and that we may not see the bigger picture but we see the small things that's going to lead us to the mm -hmm. bigger picture and i just continue to pray lord that your anointing over these children continues lord to help them grow give them passion peace and understanding lord and i just pray lord that you just direct their path, Lord, as you direct all of our paths, Lord, because we're all still children at heart. And I just love you and I thank you. And I give you the honor, glory, and the praise forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You have your Bibles that ask you to turn to Acts chapter 14. It's the passage I wrote you about last night. Acts chapter 14. We're going to start in Acts 13, but we're not necessarily going to read from 13, but we're, the crux of what we're going to say is Acts chapter 14. So, Acts chapter 14, it's where we'll find most of our story today, Acts chapter 14. So, why don't we have a word of prayer, and we will jump right in. Let's pray. Father... I ask you to encourage us. I ask you, Lord, today as we hear your word, I ask you, Lord, for those at home and those that are live on campus here today, I ask you to speak to our hearts, and not only, Lord, speak, but I ask you to help us to respond to your word today. Because that's the deal, Lord. Because I know you speak. But I ask you to help us to respond. I ask you to take all the reservations that everyone has about, oh, I don't know. I, I'm not. I, take those reservations and help us to jump in with both feet and follow you as Lord and Savior of our lives today. Please do that. For those that do not know you as their Savior, today be the day, please, Lord, that they respond to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
There's notes for you if you'd like to take some notes and remember some things. So, as we look at our context for this message today, it begins in Acts chapter 13, actually starting in verse 14, uh, at thir Acts 13, starting in verse 14, but he's speaking to in a Jewish synagogue, and Paul is in Antioch of Presidia. Antioch of Presidia. Uh, please know that there are two Antiochs in Paul's travels. So it's like uh, Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania, and Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Actually, there are loads. I googled Mount Pleasant one time, and there are lots of Mount Pleasants all over the country. But, uh, but anyways, this is Antioch of Presidia that Paul is in this area. Pam, why don't you show those maps? Uh, show map one. Okay, listen, this is Antioch of Presidia right here. Antioch of Presidia. And let me give you the context. You know it's the Mediterranean Sea that they're in. Here's Crete, here's uh, Cyprus, and here's Jerusalem down here. This is the Promised Land all along here. But this is Antioch of Presidia. This is Asia Minor. These, these areas right here is where, and over here, this is Greece. And over there, those areas are where Paul went on his missionary journeys to. So he spent a lot of time in those areas. In fact, if you read the book of Revelation, uh, do you know the seven churches that Jesus said, this, uh, he said, this is what I like about you. And then he says to those seven churches, this is what I have against you. It's found right here. If you can just, you can't hardly read the writing. So here's the church of Philadelphia, Sardis, Ephesus, Smyrna, Thyatira, all those churches. That's where he's actually speaking in Revelation to these churches. But those are, those, the, all these areas were, the, the, these lines here, these red lines, those were Paul's missionary journeys. He did three missionary journeys. I think that's the first missionary journey. And I have three maps with three different missionary journeys and the places he went. It's easier when someone maps it all out for you and all that stuff. But anyway, so that's it. That's, that's where Paul is at right here. In Antioch right here of Brasidia. Here's the other Antioch, Antioch of Syria. That's the Syria of someone, if you hear Syria on the news, uh, modern day, that's the same Syria. It's northern, it's north of the promised land. So anyway, there's Antioch of Syria and Antioch of uh, Presidia, and that's where Paul, you can show the other, show the next map down. This is just a close up of it. Antioch of Presidia, and here's Antioch of Syria. Okay, and the Mediterranean, kind of, it doesn't separate them. But anyways, if you think about this, here's where, who do you think's from here? Tarsus? Saul. Saul's part Tarsus, if you know the area maps at all. Uh, so I thought about one day even taking a trip over there. I like to take Paul's trips and go and visit all those places. So, but anyway, someday when I'm old. So, but anyway. Yeah, yuck, 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 yuck. So, anyways, but that's Antioch. Paul's in Antioch of Presidia. So, Antioch of Syria was Paul's, uh, Paul and Barnabas's kind of launching point. They, they did a lot of interaction in that area with a church, and when they come home, many times, I think it was a nice port city that he, when he would come back from a missionary trip, and he had people there, and he would always land back in, he would always land back in uh, Antioch of Syria, and kind of get refreshed, and then he would make his way back down to Jerusalem, and give a report to all those people and that type of thing. So, anyways, that was one of his launching points, kind of a home base. Acts now in Acts chapter thirteen, we find that Paul and Barnabas is in the Antioch of Presidia, where I showed you on a trip. He's in a synagogue, and honestly, he's in a synagogue just listening, just listening, just like you are. Just in a synagogue, we're in a church, just listening. In verse 15, the synagogue leader, he reads the Old Testament. Traditionally, this is what they did. They read the Old Testament, 
And then this synagogue leader asked, because Paul and Barnabas were there and they were Jewish men, he asked Paul and Barnabas if they had any positive word, any positive word that they could share with us as the reading is concluded from the Old Testament. Any positive word. Of course, that's a bad thing to say to Paul. <laughs> Do you have a word? And mo most people would say, well, not really. I don't have. It was just nice hearing your word. And, you know, Paul stood up. Paul stood up, always stood up when had opportunity. Paul stood up and in typical fashion, he started talking about the forefathers about the Jewish forefathers. He started talking about where everything came from in Judaism. He started talking about the forefathers. The forefathers looking for the Messiah. Because he, he knew where he was going. Paul knew what trip he was going to take them on. And so he was talking about the forefathers going towards looking for the Messiah. Then on to the present day, Paul said, where the Jews, the Jewish folks, rejected the Messiah. Now, not according to them, but according to Paul. He took them on a trip to modern day, and he said, the Messiah came, and he was here, and you rejected him. That's what he told them. Acts 13, uh, the Jews mostly rejected the Messiah, and the Gentiles were more receptive, somewhat warmed to the Messiah. So, the Jewish leaders were stirred up at that point and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas. Almost every place he went, he got a smack in the mouth over the same. You would think, well, someone would ask, well, why didn't he change his message? Maybe he wouldn't get smacked in the mouth. Maybe because he knew that message was of God. That message of God, and he did not run from that. So, Acts chapter 13, verse 51, says Paul and Barnabas, after they had just the angry crowd turned on them, got a smack in the mouth, uh, Paul and Barnabas shook outside the city, shook the dust of their feet, off their feet, and left the city. Jesus told many of the apostles to do this. If they reject you, he said, to, sh to show that the Jews are rejecting the message of Christ, and they're no better than pagan Gentiles. He said, go outside the city, take your sandals off, dust the dust of that town off your feet, and go on to the next town. Symbolic. It was symbolic of, of their rejection. That they're no better. That they claim superiority over the Gentiles. And Christ told them, dust the dust of their feet off your sandals. So, Paul and Barnabas moved on. And they went to a town called Iconium. In Acts chapter 14 now, we're in Acts chapter 14. So Paul and Barnabas spoke to loads of Jews and Gentiles, and many, many believed, Jews and Gentiles, many believed. In, ver in chapter 14, verse 2, it says, the ones who didn't believe began to stir up trouble. That was simply like the rule of thumb. Because if you don't buy in, they were serious about it. They're, they're, they're rejecting the gospel. They were serious, and they stirred up trouble. Verse 3, Paul and Barnabas stayed put and continued to preach. It says, if you follow those passages down, it says that a violent attempt was made on their lives, and they left for several small towns about 18 miles south of Iconium, small towns such as Lystra, Derby and Lyconia. Small little towns about 18 miles south of, if, if, you, if you don't necessarily see the map, but anyways, these were pagan cities. Paul just moved on and went on with the gospel. There were synagogues there and places to speak. But in Acts chapter 14, starting in verse 8, 
please hear the story here. Hear the story and see what happens next. So starting in uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 8, there is this passage here. I'll go ahead and read this. It's just, this is where we're going to pull up and park and hear the story from today. So it says, while they were at Lystra, this is a little small town, 18 miles south of Iconium. It says, Paul and Barnabas came upon a crippled uh, a man with crippled feet. He had been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached. Looking straight at him, Paul realized that he had faith to be healed. Faith to be healed. So Paul called to him in a loud voice, Stand up! And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, These men are gods in human form. They decided that Barnabas was the Greek god Zeus <laughs> and that Paul was Hermes uh, since he was the chief speaker. I forget what the... Uh, I forget, there's another name for him that's recognized. Mercury, uh, Mercurius, I think, uh, was another name they called him. But anyways, Hermes, it has in this, in this uh, translation, since he was the chief speaker. Now, the temple of Zeus was located just outside of town. So the priest of the temple and the crowd brought bulls and wreaths of flowers to the town gates, and they prepared to offer sacrifices to the apostles. But when Paul and Barnabas heard... Uh, uh, what was happening, they tore their clothes in dismay and ran out among the people shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We are merely human beings, just like you. We have come to bring you the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. In the past, he permitted all the nations to go their own way, but he never let them without, left them without evidence of himself and his goodness. For instance, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. He said he's given you all that. But even these words, Paul and Barnabas, but even with these words, Paul and Barnabas could scarcely restrain the people from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side. They stoned Paul. I, that, boy, that's the fastest trip from a hero to a zero. <laughs> I mean, they were worshiping them and then within, within an hour or so, they're stoning them. So then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium, won the crowds at her side. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town, thinking he was dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into town. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby, another small little town. So, now from these 12 verses, I would like us to see, I gave you some notes, I would like us to see... Uh, four responses. Four responses from the people that were on site there. Four responses I would like us to see. So, in your notes, number one, notice the response from the crippled man. The response from the crippled man. Notice his response. It's in from verse 8 to 10. We won't read that again. This man was crippled from birth. One Bible teacher said he was probably around 30 years old. That's a load of years to never walk. 30 years. A load of years to be crippled. Friends and neighbors and townspeople see him daily as handicapped. They, were, they, they saw him daily as a handicapped person that could not walk. This man heard, heard Paul speak. Paul looked at him, and I, I don't necessarily know how this goes. A little bit, I think I do. But Paul looked at him and perceived that this man's soul 
had been stirred. He looked at him and perceived that. Folks, you know that when God's word is spoken, oh, please hear this. When God's word is spoken, the spirit of God moves in the heart of those that hear it. It's strangely enough, this is how God's word works. The spirit of God is directly tied to God's word. And when God's word is spoken, no matter where God's word is spoken, the spirit of God has the ability to speak to hearts. You can boo, you can put up your fist and do all you can. You can do a little dance and you can shake it off. You can turn your back on it. You can resist it. But God has the ability to speak to hearts. The ability. And I'm not saying that he speaks to every heart. I'm not saying that. Because I don't know which hearts he speaks to and which ones he's rocking today. I don't know which one. I don't know. If, uh, though, do you say, well, there's people that are listening. Uh, there's people that listen in Michigan and California. And honestly, I don't know. I just do not know as God's word is spoken. And I do not know if God is speaking to your heart even right now. And I don't know the battle that you're putting up or you or home are putting up. I don't know that, but God knows. God knows who's resisting. God knows who's receptive. The Spirit of God knows all that. Who's receptive? He knows that. Today, as he's speaking, as the word is being spoken, you have to know that God's trying to make a connection with your heart. Like this crippled man. Do you think there are other people that had needs in that hearing that Paul was speaking in that group? Yeah, I'll bet any money. Just like our congregation, there's all kind of needs, all kind of hurts, all kind of things that are going on in our lives. The Spirit of God knows every bit of that. And the Spirit of God has the ability to speak, speak into our lives. It's not so much is he speaking. The big deal is, are you responding? Are you responding? Listen, he moves in the hearts of those who hear it. It will happen even today. And that's what happened here. This man's faith grew as he listened to Paul speak for God. This man's faith grew. Acts chapter 14, verse 10 says, Paul said this to this guy. Paul perceives it, and he said to this guy, he said, stand up. Just like if I would, you don't have to do this, Lou, but just like if I perceived this, and, and I perceived the Spirit of God speaking to Lou, and I, just like this. I say, Lou, stand up. Sir, stand up. Now, see, Lou's hard-hearted because he didn't stand up. <laughs> so, he was set up. Yeah, he was set up, too. So. <laughs> but that's the deal. That's what went on here. That's just to listen. Don't imagine it's like there's a heavenly host saying, ooh. <laughs> God's word was spoken, and Paul perceived it. That this guy's heart was moved. I don't know what gave him that inkling. But he said, stand up. And this crippled man that had never walked stood up. Stood up. Somehow the power of God molded and created muscles where there weren't any. After 30 years, there weren't any. And this man stood up for the first time in his life. After all those years, now this guy is up and running. This guy's up and running. This man responded to God's word. But I have to ask, I have to ask, how's your response? How is your response when the Spirit of God speaks to you? 
Listen, I have tremendous experience with rejecting the things of God. I know the score there. I know the score probably better than you about rejecting God's word. Listen, up until the day that I bowed my knee to Christ, every service my parents ever drug me into, they drug us. You say, they made you go to church? Oh, yeah. Good Lord, if I'm living in that house, my parents made me go to church. Made me go to church, and I didn't like it. I thought, they got bad attitudes, my parents. <laughs> they got bad attitudes. Every service I ever went to, the Spirit of God spoke to me. Spoke to me. I hated it. I would stand behind a pew when some pastor would give the invitation, and the Spirit of God was yanking on my heart, and I would sing rock music in my head. I would drown out everything with crazy lyrics and TV shows, and, and I would just, just try and focus on them. Other than that, God was breaking my heart. And I rejected almost every service. As a teenager, rejected it all. That's why I say, I don't, I don't know what goes on in your hearts. Really, I don't. I don't know what goes on. I have to believe God is speaking. I have to believe God is speaking from his word. I have to believe that many just do not respond because that was my forte. I'm not going to, because you know all you have to change? All that has to happen if you respond to the Lord Jesus Christ, your life changes. The old is gone, the new has come. And I knew that, I knew that, I knew that. I was raised in church all my life, I knew that, and I did not want that. I hunkered down and rejected every single time. Sometimes, sometimes, I'm telling you this, sometimes God would just break my heart and I would be so sad leaving church. And I had to put on an act like I wasn't. I remember one time with Donna in church. This is before we even went to church. That God spoke powerfully. And Donna said, let me out. I'm going to go down front and pray with someone. She did slip from her seat. And I thought, "This is." I'm telling you the truth. I thought, oh, crap. <laughs> That's what I thought. Oh, crap. She's down front praying. Praying and trying to make things right with the Lord Jesus. She knew we were out of line. Knew we were out bad. Off, uh, uh, just off spiritually. And she was down praying. And then that week, that pastor showed up at our door. That pastor showed up at the door. And guess what we did? Some would say, well, what do you mean, what did you do? You opened the door and welcomed him in, and Donna prayed with him, and Donna told about God spoke. And uh, No, this is what we did. I told her, we're not answering that stupid door. Oh. So he's out there like this. And I'm standing around the corner in the house. I'm not answering that door. Why did he come here? No, I know why he came, because you did what you did Sunday. <laughs> you say, Pastor... Well, I wasn't a pastor then. Right. I was a wildly rebellious punk. And he knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked, and then he went away. I yelled at Donna. I said, see? See what happens <laughs> when you do that? It's not even funny. Amy's laughing, but it's not funny. It's horrible. It's horrible. God had spoken to our hearts so many times. Just like this guy. I have to wonder, what if this guy would not have stood up? What if he wouldn't have responded? Responded. Do you know what God has for you if you respond to him? He has a magnificent, magnificent life planned for you. Planned for you if you will respond to his word. So, how do you respond? Think about it. When God moves in your heart, 
I know what I did. I shoveled it. I kind of just deflected. I kind of just said, yeah, that was good. Yeah, this is really good. And uh, yeah, and then just, but I never let it set in my heart. I never let it get a hold of me. I ran out, shook hands with a couple people, hurried outside, and it was over. Kind of, I just went back to my life. So, how is it that you respond to God, God's word? Does it convict you? Does it teach you? Does it make us realize what's wrong in our lives? It can even correct us, according to, to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 15, 3, 16. It can even correct us. Or is it like an article that you just read and you know it's pretty good, but uh, it's okay advice, but it's not okay for my stage in life right now. And you kind of just shovel it off. I did that for years. I did that for 10 years in my life. I was in pain, really. I was in pain in those years, spiritually in pain for those years. I can look back now and see I was in pain. Folks, all throughout my life, I sat in services and did not respond. Ten years, did not respond. And then I just stopped going. Stopped going. Unmoved. When God, I would not move. So you would say, someone would say, my mother was wondering, is not God speaking? I would never let her have the satisfaction or my wife, after she gave her life to Christ, I would never let them have the satisfaction of knowing that God is speaking to my heart. Never! You say, well, that's bad. <laughs> it is. It is. That's why I say I know. I know what being wayward. I know what being far from God is. I know that. It's all too fresh. And I know when God speaks. And I know when people do not respond, I can see that. I, I Listen, I know what that feels like. Listen, and on that day in Lystra, a man's heart was moved. On that day, a man's heart was moved. I don't really understand it, but one day in May, in 1980, 43 years ago, God moved powerfully in my heart. Starting at my home, I got up, got dressed, threw on a couple of things. I never even had any good clothes. What do you need good clothes for? I did just, I just was fine. But God was moving in my heart at home. I responded, folks, if God is speaking to your heart today, do not ignore it. There is no guarantee. I sat at one man's table a few years ago, and he told me that. I said, well, how do you, what, what, what are you thinking whenever I'm giving an invitation to come to Christ or to pray with somebody? What are you thinking? Is God speaking to your heart? And he said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he shockingly told me, but I have not given in yet. I said, oh, my goodness, sir. If I mentioned his name, you'd probably know him. I said, sir, do not take that for granted, that God is speaking to your heart because he might stop speaking. If God is speaking, oh, respond. You at home, if God is speaking, respond. Call me today. Call me. My number is 717-319-0668. If you forget that, get it on the podcast later. <laughs> Call me. I want to rejoice with you. But do not reject. This man, this man responded. And he stood up. He stood up. Give in, respond like this crippled man. That's the first response. Then response number two. The crowd's response to the crippled man. This is in verse uh, 11 through 13. The crowd's response to the crippled man. Folks, please know that miracles by themselves don't necessarily produce conviction or faith. 
they are almost always accompanied and tied to God's word. Because God gets the credit then. If it's tied to God's word. Paul was speaking God's word. The superstitions, the superstitious crowd uh, interpreted this healing in light of their own mythology. That's how they interpreted it. In light of their own mythology. They said the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. The gods have come down to us. It's Barnabas, they said, we're going to call you Zeus. That's who we think you are now. You're Zeus. And Paul, he was, that's what he was, Mercury, Mer Mercurius, uh, or Hermes. Interchangeable names. They said, that's who you are, Paul. The legend was that Zeus and Hermes visited the region a long, long time ago. That was the legend in that area. Legend has it that Zeus and Hermes were entertained by an older couple named Philemon and, and Bacchus who didn't know Zeus and Hermes were gods. That's what the legend says. Didn't know they were gods, and these strangers entered their home. And they didn't get the honor that they were due the first time. Hermes and Zeus. So when Paul and Barnabas were declared gods, the Lystralites, the Lystralites in Lystra were going, weren't going to blow it this time. They were going to celebrate Paul and Barnabas a.k.a. Zeus and Hermes. That's what they're going to do now. They are going to throw a bash for these two gods that they identified that were Zeus and Hermes. So, in Paul's eyes, in Paul's eyes now, the healing was this, given by God to draw people's eyes, to draw people's eyes to the Lord. That's why the healing was given in the first place for this guy. But when mankind uses or interprets the mighty works of God in their own way, only this takes place, perversion. When mankind takes it and uses it for themselves, perversion results. The list is long of all the cults and isms that have perverted God's word. When God moves in this world, and God is not given the credit, Perversion results. This miracle was misused. Number one, the response of the crippled man. Number two, the response from the people to the crippled man. And then number three in your notes, the response of the apostles to the crowd. In verse 14 through 18, Paul and Barnabas could have let it go and used the response, used their response as a real teaching moment and just try to bring calm to the situation. Paul and Barnabas didn't see it that way. Their response to the crowd, they tore their clothes, tore their clothes in outrage and ran out to the people shouting, we are just humans like you. Just humans. We're not gods, Zeus and Hermes. And we've come to persuade you to abandon these silly God superstitions and embrace the one true God. That's why we've come. And that's why God did a miracle here with this man's feet that you all know. And then he said, we don't make gods. God makes us. We made the sky and the earth and sea and everything in them. Paul referred to to certain, uh, the, to, uh, to creation. He referred to creation that way in front of them because he was talking to pagans that didn't know the Old Testament God of creation. So he referred to creation. No, we're talking about the God that created the universe and the sun, moon, and stars and the sea. Paul continued, this living God I speak about is giving and forgiving giving and forgiving he's provided rain and crops and has filled your heart with joy for all this time and you didn't even know it who was providing it at this point the party and parade almost ground to a halt when they ran out and started yelling and tearing their clothes and 
the party and parade almost ground to a halt. Almost. Almost. Folks, I ask you. I ask you, when was the last time? You think about Paul correcting and Paul making a big deal about this, this lie that when they were celebrating. I ask you, when was the last time you corrected a wrong and made it right? When was the last time? Because you know it takes some chutzpah. It takes you seeing a wrong, and then it takes you to risk to try and make it right, like Paul and Barnabas did. I think about this. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it says this. Dear brothers and sisters, Paul writes this to the Galatian people. It says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. You and me corrected a wrong or gently and humbly help someone get back on to the right path. Now I understand these were pagans, but Paul saw a wrong. And he was willing to risk it to make it right. Help restore someone. Help restore someone. It's an act of love to help restore a brother or sister. You say, well, I, I, I listen, I uh, said hi to them at Walmart. And uh, they just didn't respond or they didn't bring up anything. Listen, help restore a wrong to make it right. Help restore a brother or a sister that's off into the weeds. Paul and Barnabas could have kept quiet. They could have no ignored it. They could have not got involved. They could have run from it. They could have made excuses for it. They could have explained it away. Like these are pagans. You know, what do you expect out of them? Live, live and let live. I remember having an argument with one person in my family years ago that they were upset about missionaries taking the gospel to the lands to foreign lands and I said well they were upset about that I said live them let them, let them live like that what do you care and I said well it's not a matter of what we care it's a matter of what Christ told us to do take the gospel to every creature in the world I said, if your argument is not with the missionaries, your argument is with, him, with Christ. And this is a big old burly man, and he was, you could see smoke coming out of his ears. And I said, well, listen, let's not argue in front of everybody. It's a Christmas time. And I said, let's step out in the garage, and I'll show you from Scripture. He goes, I'd like to step out in the garage with you. So... So I thought, okay, let's call a timeout here. And uh, so, but nonetheless, nonetheless, but I did a little more than that to provoke. <laughs> that was kind of my nature. So, and I've calmed down since a little bit. So anyways, I'm a little more dip diplomatic. So and explained it. Listen, explained it away. They could have explained it away. Since nice things, of, they, they could have said nice things about Zeus and Hermes. It's a nice idea, and I'm proud of you people for being nice. Mm -hmm. They could have said all kinds of things, but they didn't. They risked their peace, they risked their chance of being a witness, and the good connection that they had with these people. These people were worshiping them. They could have done all kinds of things. Those are all hard choices for all of us. But Paul and Barnabas made them. And so it is with every Christ follower. We face hard choices many times. Hard choices. Number one, the response of the crippled man. Number two, the response of the crowd to the crippled man. Number three, the response of the apostles to the crowd. And then lastly, number four, the response of the disciples to Paul. The response of the disciples to Paul. Verse 19 through 20. The angry Jews from Antioch and Iconium won the crowd over. They poisoned the gospel, divided the people, and told half-truths. 
to poison the crowd. This is the second of five times that crowds were incited when Paul was speaking the gospel. The second of five times that riots and Paul was had to be Jesus beat out of him. They stoned him and left him for dead. The disciples gather around him. The scriptures didn't say that he was really dead. They were he was left for dead. Left for dead. Very possibly knocked unconscious. The disciples gathered around him. They got up and then went back to town. I could think of several things I would maybe do, and going back to town wouldn't be one of them. <laughs> I wouldn't think. Paul got up and went back to town. The disciples gathered around him. They were probably new believers. They were, they were probably in crisis. This was, this was kind of a crisis situation. They were a minority. Their leader had been stoned right in front of them. Things looked pretty bleak. But they stood around him. They stood around him in loyalty. Stood around him in loyalty and love. Probably joined hands and hearts. And if he was left for dead, they probably prayed. Somehow, some way, Paul got up and went back to town. Went back to town. Last page for anybody counting. One Bible teacher said that Paul wouldn't be charged. Probably this is why he went back to town. He wouldn't be charged a second time for the same thing. I wouldn't be willing to risk it probably at that point. So anyways, he wouldn't be charged, so he went back. So I have to ask. I have to ask. How is your loyalty towards other Christ followers? Because there's a lot of reasons not to be loyal to other Christ followers. You might say, well, I'm not sticking up for him. You know, he has a bad attitude. You know, I don't care if they beat him up. I don't care if they fired him. I don't care if they did this. I don't care because, uh, well, they deserved it. Or how is your loyalty towards other believers? You know you're not. You know we are not the furthest thing from perfection ourselves. How is your loyalty to other Christ followers? Do you have a heart to stand with other believers who are persecuted for their faith? Do you have a heart to do that at work or in your neighborhood? If someone talks about one of your neighbors, an unbeliever talks about one of your neighbors, do you kind of stand with or try and be a peacemaker there? Honestly, try, do you try that? Or would you rather not get involved in my neighborhood I heard some violent yelling about three weeks ago violent yelling it was one of my neighbors screaming at another neighbor and I parked and went right over and I said what can I do to help what can I do to help and do you want me to go over and speak to them for you I will and I'm still looking for them to be home where I can go over and speak to the other neighbor. I've already spoken to one. You know why? Because I want to be a peacemaker in my neighborhood. You say, well, you, you, you're liable to get yelled at yourself. Yeah, I don't care. I'm old. I've got one foot in the grave. I'm going to do that. I want to do that. I want to be a peacemaker. Why? Because I'm a Christ follower. I want to be a peacemaker. How are you? How are you when it comes to standing with others? How are you? Do you want to be a peacemaker? Or is that just simply, nah, it's just too much trouble. I got enough problems. You know, uh, they're taking my TV series off the air. <laughs> I've got enough problems. I'm going to have to deal with that one. I heard someone that said they were persecuted the other day. Not here. But I was listening. It was kind of cartoony. They said, yeah, I went to a church one time, and, uh, and the temperature was 71 degrees in there, and I asked them to turn it up because I was cold, and they said they wouldn't. They said I left in anger. They said persecution rules. Persecution rules. Yeah. So, honestly, do you have a heart to stand with other believers? Stand with other believers at work in your neighborhood, 
or would you rather not get involved? The disciples took a risk and gathered around their friend, Paul. Gathered around him. So, Pastor, what do you want us to do? We're ready to close the service. So, please, if you've been sleeping this time, you're going to be out of context because you slept all time. But you say, what do you want us to do, Pastor? This is what I want you to do. I want you to think about your response to God's word and be alert to a hard heart. Be alert to a hard heart. Because you know what's going to stop you from responding? A hard heart. You know what the Bible says? You know what the Bible says? It says the heart is deceitful above all else. Who can know it? And if God has spoken to your heart, I ask you to respond. Be aware of a hard heart situation. Be aware. And then this. What else do you want us to do, Pastor? I want you to be more responsive to the lies floating around and get involved in correcting them. You say, well, oh... That'll cost me something, you know. I'm going to put my foot somewhere or put my... You don't have to do it angrily and tell everybody they're idiots. You can maybe try and get wisdom and share something that is just full of wisdom that would maybe help. That would maybe help the situation. And then lastly this. I want you to be more responsive to a believer that is in trouble. Paul was laying out, they said that he was left for dead and they gathered around him. They associated with him. They associated with him, you know why we wouldn't? Many times, because of our pride. Because of our pride. Not always, but many times because of our pride. We wouldn't associate with that, even if you help them up, or even if you say, listen, that's tough what you're going through. That's honestly, uh, but you can associate with them. You can help that horrible sting. It's a sting when someone's persecuted. It's a sting when someone has something hideous happen in their life. It's a sting and you can help them possibly do this. Gather around them. In times like that, you will make a friend. You will make a friend like you have never made before. Just by standing with them and showing compassion for them. Right or wrong. I know we don't want to be associated with their wrong. But you will make a friend if you stand with people. Stand with people. So, I say this, two words. The and let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for how good you are to us. I ask you, Lord, as we think about all that, all the responses that were in within this story, I ask you, Lord, as we think about one response, it's the response of the crippled man. Paul said, stand up, and he did. I ask you, Lord, today, if you are speaking to people's hearts, I ask you to help us to do something about it. Help us to respond. Please do that, Lord Jesus. Give us the courage to respond. That's the real courage. Not necessarily to hear, but to respond. To your word. I ask you, Lord, as we close in prayer and sing a song of invitation, if God has spoken to hearts today, if you have spoken to hearts, I ask you, Lord, to help people, help us to respond. For those at home, if God has spoken to your heart, text me, email me, call me, and respond to God's word. If God has spoken to your heart today, please tell me about it today. Respond. Respond. 
respond to the voice of God in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to close with one last song this morning. Jesus, be the center. Thank you.